Good evening. Uh, I'm Bob Glauber. I'm a member of the faculty in the Masafar Rahmani uh, Center for Business and Government. And I want to welcome you to the forum this evening uh, where our speaker is Sheila Baer, who is chairman of the FDIC. Uh, Sheila occupies the same position as several uh, other past high profile chairmen uh, of what is a most important financial regulatory agency. Uh, including uh, Bill Seidman, uh, Bill Isaacs. Of course, Sheila can lay claim to one tribute uh, to which they couldn't. Uh, she was named in 2008 and again in 2009 by Forbes magazine as the second most powerful woman in the world after Germany's chancellor, uh, Angela Merkel. Uh, at this point, uh, I'd like to note that this annual lecture series is funded by a grant from NASD, uh, now FINRA, uh, which is the private sector regulator of the securities industry and where I spent a good part of the last decade. Uh, we have here this evening, uh, and I'd like to welcome uh, Todd DeGancy, uh, Rick Ketchum, who is the CEO and chairman. Todd is, is the uh, CFO and vice, executive vice president. Uh, and thank them again for the organization's support of, of this series. I've known uh, Sheila over a number of years, starting with uh, the days I spent at Treasury in the Bush 41 administration. And I've watched Sheila as she has filled one after another uh, extraordinarily important government position. Uh, she's been counsel uh, to Senate, then Senate Majority Leader Bob Dole in the 80s. Uh, she was a commissioner and then acting chairman of the CFTC in the early 90s. Uh, she was Assistant Secretary for Financial Institutions and Treasury in the early 2000s. She's also been uh, a fellow academic of ours, uh, serving as the Dean's Professor of Financial Regulatory Policy at the Eisenberg School of Management at the University of Massachusetts uh, in Amherst, uh, before taking up her position at the FDIC. And by an odd coincidence, uh, I got to occupy her former office uh, at UMass several weeks ago when I was there to give a seminar. And Sheila, I want to tell you, all of your colleagues there would like very much to have you back. Uh, Sheila has held her position uh, at the FDIC at a time of what I think all of you know are unrivaled challenges uh, for financial regulators. Uh, she's presided over what's called the resolution, that's a financial regulatory speak for bankruptcy of 270 banks uh, during the last year and a half. And perhaps more important looking backward, she sat on top of the FDIC insurance fund, which has been viewed by other regulators and government officials as a short term solution to many potentially cataclysmic systemic failures of the financial system. Under great pressure, she has had to decide when to put that fund to use and at risk and when to say no. Of course, of greater importance, I think, looking forward, she will be responsible under the new financial law, the Dodd-Frank Act, for the resolution process of troubled financial institutions, both within the banking system, but also outside it. Faced with that task, she's going to have to fashion policies which prevent systemic meltdowns, while at the same time, if possible, not extending the too-big-to-fail doctrine. That doctrine uh, has been responsible for a series of taxpayer bailouts and for creating a regime of moral hazard that arises from protecting failing financial institutions and that encourage excessive risk taking. From the title of her talk this evening, I expect that Sheila is going to discuss just that topic, which is wonderful. And so I'm sure all of you would like to hear what she has to say. And without further ado, uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce to you Sheila Blair. Thank, thank you, Bob. That was a very nice introduction. I was, uh, we were chatting before the, the speech, and I told him that this year I dropped actually to 15 in the, uh, in the Forbes Most Powerful Women list, and uh, I think that's because banks are getting healthier, so my, uh, my influence is declining. So that's probably a good thing that I'm dropping, but I was a little dismayed that Lady Gaga ranked above me, so I don't... Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm not sure what their criteria is, but it was, it was very flattering. It has been very flattering. I, um, 
I also want to thank you all for coming. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I had to remember when I was at UMass, I would frequently arrange, uh, we had a speaker's program there as well. And when we weren't quite sure we are going to fill up the room, we offered class credit. <laughs> so I don't know, I won't be rude and ask how many of you are getting credit for being here. But, um, but anyway, thank you for whatever reasons. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to return to the state of Massachusetts and speak to you in this very prestigious, prestigious uh, forum. I think it's safe to say that the past couple of years have been the most eventful period for U.S. economic policy since the 1930s. And that, of course, is because during this time, our nation has suffered its most serious economic setback since the Great Depression. When short-term money markets seized up in September and October of 2008, following the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, policymakers were forced to undertake unprecedented emergency measures to stabilize our financial system. We knew at the time that the crisis posed a grave threat to the U.S. economy. During the next six months, the weekly volume of domestic steel production, for instance, fell by one half, and employers shed more than four million jobs. In all, about 6.3 million mortgages have entered foreclosure since the recession started, and almost 15 million people remain out of work, and that is not counting the millions who are underemployed or who have left the labor force. These statistics can only hint at the true human dimension of the crisis and nonetheless explain the urgency with which Congress, the administration, and regulators have pursued financial regulatory reform. The changes authorized in July by the Dodd-Frank Act are historic in their scope. The FDIC and other regulatory bodies are now engaged in an extensive implementation process. As you may have been hearing, change itself can be unsettling to financial industry participants and other economic actors. Some are even citing the reforms as a source of uncertainty that may be holding back the economic recovery. What I would like to do this evening is outline for you what I see as the rationale for these reforms and describe how the U.S. financial system will work once they are fully implemented. The crisis has revealed some critical flaws in how our financial system operated and how it was regulated. In the aftermath of the crisis, a policy of business as usual was simply not an option. It would have been an invitation for another similar crisis in the not too distant future. But if we follow through and implement these reforms in a sensible, transparent manner, we should see, soon see a financial system where market discipline, very important, is restored. The cost of risk taking are borne by shareholders and creditors, not by the public. Consumers are better protected. And regulators are much more attuned to the types of systemic risks that led to this crisis. One of the most fundamental problems that led to the crisis was that a number of large banks and other financial companies, as Bob indicated, were viewed as too big to fail. This term is really just shorthand for the dilemma that policymakers faced in the fall of 2008 when a number of these institutions ran into serious trouble. We faced this choice, to let them fail and risk destabilizing the entire financial system, or to bail them out, imposing costs on the taxpayer and encouraging the type of risky behavior that caused the crisis in the first place. Needless to say, both of these options were highly problematic. How did we get into this situation? One big reason is that neither bank holding companies nor non-bank financial companies, both of which figured prominently in the crisis, were subject to an FDIC-like receivership authority. That means they could not be resolved in an orderly fashion without bailing out debt and equity holders or disrupting the financial system. Instead, these Senate entities were subject to the commercial bankruptcy process where it takes a long time and a lot of money to determine what creditors ultimately stand to collect. For example, the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy has cost almost a billion dollars to administer so far, and many creditors still do not know where they stand. By contrast, because of our ability to plan in advance, the FDIC receivership process for insured banks and thrifts is not perfect, but it does generally sort most of this out over a much shorter time frame and we return the failed institution to private hands right away. That's a key priority of our process. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Dodd-Frank Act, for the first time, gives the FDIC a similar set of receivership powers to close and liquidate systemically important financial firms that are failing. The FDIC recently issued a proposed rule clarifying how we would handle the claims process under this new authority. In resolving failed banks, federal law has long given the FDIC discretion to pay certain creditors more than others when it's necessary to maintain essential operations or when it will maximize our recoveries. Certain bills need to be paid to keep the institution running. For instance, the FDIC would typically continue paying firms for services such as IT, utilities, payments processing, and building maintenance, 
even though these providers are technically unsecured creditors. Dodd-Frank gives the FDIC similar discretion in resolving non-bank financial institutions. While we have always used this power very narrowly, this new authority has created uncertainty among those who are unfamiliar with our process. Our proposed rule makes clear that some creditors will never be deemed essential to operations or maximizing value. It states clearly the shareholders, subordinated debt, and long-term bondholders will never qualify to receive additional payments above their liquidation value under the statutory priority of claims. It also affirms that even secured creditors will only be protected to the extent of the fair value of their collateral, with any unsecured portion, portion remaining subject to loss. By ensuring that all creditors know that they are, at risk and loss of, they are at risk of loss and a failure, this proposed rule is a solid first step in implementing the resolution authority under Dodd-Frank and ending too big to fail. Another key element of the implementation process will be to develop requirements for the resolution plans that all systemically important financial companies now have to establish. These resolution plans, also known as living wills, are essentially blueprints for the orderly unwinding of the company should it run into problems. Under Dodd-Frank, the FDIC and the Federal Reserve wield considerable authority to shape the content of these plans. If the plans are found not to be credible, the FDIC and the Fed can even compel the divestiture of activities that would unduly interfere with the orderly liquidation of these companies. The success or failure of the new regulatory regime will hinge in large part on how credible these resolution plans are as guides to resolving these companies. So it is critically important that they be viewed not as simply paper exercise, but they are actually actionable documents. Let me briefly describe to you the practical significance of this new resolution authority. In a world of too big to fail, risk taking is subsidized by the government. Systemically important companies take on too much risk because the gains are private, while the losses are socialized. Market discipline fails to rein in the excesses of these institutions because equity and debt holders, who should rightly be at risk if things go wrong, enjoy an implicit government backstop. This skewing of financial incentives inevitably leads to a misallocation of capital and credit flows. In this crisis, far too much credit was directed to single-family housing when it might have been put to far better use in rental housing, public infrastructure, or industry sectors such as energy and manufacturing. The figures I cited a few minutes ago on foreclosures and unemployed workers speak to the scale of the resources wasted in this episode. And prescriptive regulation will only take you so far in fixing the problem. After all, banking was already among the most heavily regulated of all economic sectors. It was the incentives in place under Too Big to Fail that helped push risk out of the so-called shadow banking system into the so-called shadow banking system where regulation was the lightest. And that's where you saw most of the subprime and non-traditional mortgage lending, as well as holdings of mortgage-related derivative instruments. So implementing the new resolution authority and ending Too Big to Fail is a game changer as far as, far as I'm concerned in terms of economic incentives. Market discipline will be restored. Financial incentives will be better aligned. Capital and credit will be allocated more efficiently, and taxpayers will no longer be on the hook when financial co companies get it wrong. I focus this discussion on the Resolution Authority under Dodd-Frank because I do think it is fundamental to change incentives and behavior on Wall Street and among the big banks. But there are three other elements of reform that I would also like to touch on. The first is a need to strengthen bank capital requirements. As many of you know, the Basel Committee recently reached a compromise on stronger international standards for the quality and quantity of bank capital around the world. The standards are not as high as many of us would have liked, but there should be no doubt that they are a big, big improvement over the current requirements. I also know that there are concerns that higher capital requirements will reduce the balance sheet capacity of the banking industry and shook off the availability of credit. While it would not be cost-free to move to a stronger capital regime, I do not agree that the new requirements will reduce the availability of credit or significantly raise borrowing costs. Studies by economists here at Harvard, the University of Chicago, and the Bank for International Settlements argue persuasively that the impact on the cost of credit will be modest and that these costs will be far outweighed by the benefits of a more stable financial system. Dodd-Frank also strengthens consumer protection in the financial marketplace which is also essential to financial stability. There is ample evidence that consumers did not understand the subprime and non-traditional mortgages that were sold to them in the run-up to this crisis. When it comes to financial regulation, our experience shows that safety and soundness and consumer protection are really two sides of the same coin. 
where standards are not uniform and consumers are not well informed, there will be a race to the bottom in credit practices. The losers in this race will include both legitimate financial providers and the consumers that the system is supposed to be protecting. I know there are concerns that the new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau created under Dodd-Frank will impose an additional level of regulation on banks and thrifts, but I think the CFPP provides a golden opportunity to simplify consumer rules, making them work better for consumers while making them less costly for banks, especially community banks, to comply with. It also provides the opportunity to apply more rigorous rules and examinations on non-bank providers while rewarding good actors who are trying to do the right thing by their customers. Under the new law, the CFPB director will sit on the FDIC board and enforcement of its rules will remain with bank supervisors for institutions under $10 billion in size. I think this will go a long way toward ensuring that legitimate financial providers are not adversely impacted for problems that they did not create. Finally, the identification and mitigation of systemic risks by regulators was simply inadequate in the run-up to the crisis. That is why the Dodd-Frank Act established a Financial Stability Oversight Council made up at the Treasury, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, and many other financial regulators. A key task for the Council is to identify risks to financial stability and potential gaps in regulation, and then to make recommendations for primary regulators and other policymakers to take action that would mitigate those risks. The FSOC, as we call it, held its first meeting on October 1st. And even as we continue to deal with the aftermath of the last crisis, we all know there are new risks on the horizon. For example, with interest rates currently at historic lows, we know eventually they will go up. The question is how abrupt the shift will be and how well prepared governments, variable rate borrowers, and financial institutions will be when it inevitably occurs. The Council is charged with looking across the financial system evaluating these risks and making recommendations for primary regulators and other policy makers to take action to mitigate them. At the same time, it was not meant to interfere with the ability of the independent agencies to fulfill their statutory mandates and move ahead with clearly needed reforms. We look forward to working with our colleagues on the Council to keep our financial system strong and to narrow the regulatory gaps that so greatly contributed to this recent financial crisis. I hope this discussion gives you a high-level overview of the strategy behind financial regulatory reform, the urgent need to make changes, and what is being done now to implement these reforms. Although change can be unsettling, in this case, the status quo was an invitation to more financial disasters down the road. These reforms promise to usher in an era of greater stability and efficiency in our financial system, and to once again make finance a pillar of support for the economy, not the other way around. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Uh, we now, by tradition, uh, have an opportunity for questions uh, for Chairman Baer. Uh, there are four microphones, two up there, two down here. Uh, rules of engagement, uh, please identify yourself and your affiliation, uh, and we deal in questions. Uh, questions end with a question mark or the rise of the voice at the end. Of the <laughs> uh, so let's try and honor that. Yes, sir. Uh, Emmanuel Hooper. Actually, I do research. Uh, at, uh, I'm a consultant to uh, FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, mm -hmm. also independent research uh, here as well at Harvard. Um, we had Mary Shapiro here earlier to talk to SEC. Uh, it seems to me the question addresses the gap in this new regulation. That is that the Commercial banks were allowed to really invest in risky assets. You remember the Glass-Spiegel Act that was trying to separate risky investments. Uh, to what extent do you think that uh, this new regulation, especially since uh, credit for swaps were not taken out of the assets, uh, going forward, uh, what would you recommend that the, the banks should be held accountable that they should not be allowed to invest in risky assets the same way they did, that the investment banks did. That is, uh, they should be, to what extent should they be uh, prevented entirely from mm -hmm. acting like uh, investment banks? So that right. they, uh, if, if that had happened, believe it or not, I'm sure that this crisis would have escalated because they bought into market by securities, credit for swaps, CDUs, et cetera. Uh, can you tell us what your recommendation right. would be? Well, there is a, the so-called Volcker rule does uh, 
impose new restrictions on uh, bank and bank holding companies and other systemic entities on their ability to do, do uh, means proprietary trading. Though there's some definitional issues on what's proprietary, and, and those are things that the regulators have to work through. So I think you know we're supportive of that. I think uh, we certainly don't want insured deposits to be used for speculative uh, proprietary trading, and there are restrictions on that already. And this will strengthen them, and, and we think that's a good thing. Um, that said, though, I, I don't you know proprietary trading wasn't just the only driver here, uh, and certainly it may have contributed to losses in, for certain institutions, but. You know, the reality is bad loans. <laughs> that, you know, the, kind of the original sin was bad loans being made and then them being packaged and repackaged uh, into uh, what became totally opaque, uh, indecipherable, uh, structured, uh, structured financial products that landed on the balance sheet of a lot of institutions, banks, commercial banks, investment banks, and others. So um, we think that Volk, we support the Volcker rule. We like it. Uh, we'll work with our regulators to for meaningful implementation. but. I think that was really just a, a piece of this, and, and there, the, there was just a larger, more fundamental problem, again, with bad loans being made to begin with, and then those losses uh, being greatly uh, exacerbated by all the derivatives products that performed based on how the underlying mortgages were formed. You know, I think if it had just been the losses on the mortgages, we probably could have withstood it, but that was multiplied uh, many times over because of all these synthetic derivatives that were, uh, that their losses, their performance was based on the underlying mortgages. So. It's a, we support it, but I, I don't think that piece by itself is, is a panacea for everything that went wrong. Good question. Great. Thank you so much for yeah, being with sure. us tonight. Um, I'm Chris. I'm a junior at the college. I guess I will be succinct here. Um, first, uh, in the increasingly interconnected global financial markets, is it possible for a country to pursue uh, bank regulation by its own? Right. If not, do the uh, Basel III standards go far enough um, right. in ensuring uh, better standards of policy coordination, yeah. particularly with yeah. respect to increasing levels of tier one capital requirements? Right. That's a really good question. You know, I, I've sat through a lot of Basel committee meetings and then the, what we call the GHAS, which is the joint, the bank supervisors and the, uh, the central bank governors meet uh, too. And, um, you know, uh, it's not a size I would have liked, that 7% tangible common equity uh, ratio that we agreed on, but it is so much higher than where so many other countries were started. Uh, it, is, it is a huge improvement. So I think, um, I think there will, there is, and they also really tighten up the definition of what counts as tangible common equity, which was another issue here. So what we were calling common equity really wasn't, didn't have loss absorption capacity. So I think that, that uh, the new higher ratio in combination with deducting or narrowing the definition of what you can count as uh, common equity. And then also uh, we have new rules uh, we have two capital standards. We have a risk-based capital standard, which uh, what the denominator of that ratio uh, is uh, an expression of what we consider risk-weighted assets. So certain assets are viewed as very safe, and so they have very low risk rating, and others are viewed very risky, so they have a high risk weighting. So we're also changing the rules and making assigning a higher risk weighting on what we now know are riskier assets. So those three dynamics in combination will really bump up capital requirements. And then we also have a leverage ratio, which I have been advocating for a long time. Actually, I, I came out in 2006 and said we should have an international leverage ratio, and the economists called me a Luddite. <laughs> you know, it was like, and so now they don't say that anymore. They actually, the economists, and just about everybody else, I think, supports an international leverage ratio. So that was a positive thing, too. Um, but implementation is, is uh, key, and uh, we have different uh, philosophies and attitudes towards uh, the financial services sector, and I think, uh, uh, so I think that always is at play, but I think the 7% is a huge improvement. And we also have the ability to have higher capital standards here. I don't view that as a competitive disadvantage. I view it as a strength. Our banks are better capitalized now because we went through the, the stress testing process in early 2009. They raised a bunch of capital as a result of that. And, and so they're not really far away from the new standards already, which again is why I don't think people should worry about increased capital. Uh, cutting off uh, lending. I just don't see that happening at all. So, um, you know, it'd be nice to have a race to the top as opposed to a race to the bottom in terms of international competition. But I think overall, we should all feel good about the Basel III process uh, uh, producing as high a standard as it did. Let me just follow up sure. on a piece of what you said towards the end. The Swiss have added, as they did before, they have. a higher labor, labor requirements they on have. top of Basel That's right. Do you think that's something that the U.S. should consider? Well, I think they should. They, they, they ended up with a 10% uh, tangible common uh, equity ratio for their systemic institutions. And uh, actually, Dodd-Frank uh, 
includes a mandate to have higher prudential standards for systemic institutions. This is a directive given the Federal Reserve Board as the, uh, the entity that sets the capital standard for the holding company. And so uh, we, uh, we think, and I think there's general agreement, that that means that there should be a higher capital requirement in the U.S. and we'll have to, uh, through an interagency process, and again, the Fed has to lead on it and they'll consult with us and, and we have a very good working relationship there. But uh, what the numbers is, uh, I don't know, but I think there will be a higher, I have fairly high confidence level there will be a higher capital requirement for systemic institutions here. Hi, I'm Brandon Barford. I'm a second year MPA student at the Kennedy School. Uh, my question is about mortgage-backed securities. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on, on principal write-downs and how they affect the securities and also on second liens. Mm -hmm. And then what, what are the powers the government has to affect um, the ability to do principal write-downs or to extinguish second liens and to try to get yeah. some more value out of the securities mm -hmm. and keep homeowners in their homes? All right. Well, that, that's a really good question. Uh, we have been uh, vexed uh, throughout this crisis by uh, certain constraints in the pooling and servicing agreements that govern what you can and cannot do with mortgages uh, when they, when they you know, become troubled. So um, principal write-downs are difficult. Uh, that's why when we, uh, uh, in 2008, when we became conservator of IndyMac Bank, we, we, we uh, pioneered a new uh, loan modification protocol that's relied on interest rate deductions and extended amortizations. But we didn't include principal write-downs because we couldn't, they weren't allowed in the pooling and servicing agreements and the investors wouldn't agree to it. So I think um, with the dynamics changing and so many uh, you know, uh, homeowners being underwater, uh, there have been some investors have started exercising more flexibility than of course if, if it's a portfolio loan, if it's held by the bank or other lender, it's, it's much uh, easier to do it. And then if it's uh, securitized through Fannie and Freddie, uh, there, there are a lot more flexibilities there. But you know, uh, we've uh, I've got Rich Brown, our chief economist here in the audience, and he's going to be presenting a paper next week because we've been tracking uh, the success of the of the Indiana modifications um, over the past couple of years now, and we're finding that actually uh, the biggest driver of uh, the performance of the modification is doing it early. So in other words, don't make the homeowner wait forever uh, and leave them in limbo. Do it early and also make a meaningful uh, payment reduction. And actually, if the payment is affordable, even if the loan is underwater, uh, being uh, underwater was not a significant driver of default. And if you think about it, it makes sense. Um, if, if, you know, if, if you're going to walk away from your mortgage, you're going to take a hit to your, your credit standing, you're going to have to find another place to live, you're going to have the expenses of moving, you're going to have, you know, have the rental, the deposits and all of that. So if, if I think if most people view their house as their home, and if you give them an affordable payment, um, they'll stick with it. So uh, now if they have a, a life-changing event, they have a job, they have to sell, then they're obviously, if they're deeply underwater, uh, there's going to be strong incentives, and they're, they're going to have to, you know. So I think uh, we, we continue to uh, encourage principal write-downs with banks where we have lost share agreements for, for trouble mortgages where you have an affordability problem as well. But I was actually encouraged by these results that even when you don't have the legal flexibility to write down principal, if you give them pay, meaningful, meaningful payment relief and do it early, you know, these servicers don't have enough staff. I think that's just become uh, painfully apparent that you can provide a lot of relief for homeowners and, and facilitate a way for them to stay in their house. Will that, paper, will that paper be at the Fed FDIC conference? Next yeah, it week? will be. Yes, it will be. Okay. Yes, okay. All right. <laughs> All right, you're welcome. Yeah. Hi, my name is Becca. I'm a sophomore. I study statistics, and I guess that informs my question. Um, I read in the New York Times a few days ago that one of the first people to notice there was a problem with foreclosures in 2006 was a volunteer lawyer in Maine who looked at the foreclosure papers for a client and realized that they were just totally atypical. And I'm wondering if there's any kind of mechanism in terms of regulation for taking a sample of these very ground level transactions and just looking at them to see if they're in line with regulations. Well, yes, I think that that process is uh, being undertaken right now. We, we are not the, um, we regulate uh, about 4,800 banks, but for the most part we regulate smaller state chartered uh, uh, community banks. So we, we do not have a uh, lead regulatory authority for any of these major servicers, but the other regulators do, the OCC primarily, and then the Fed has a couple of them. Uh, we are working with them in an interagency process to, and we're lending examiners to this to go in and actually do file review, yes. So I think we need to do that. You know, uh, it's fine that banks are saying their internal audit shows that they're taking care of this, but I think we need to go in and independently verify that. And it's going to take some time because this is a local process, and so uh, the requirements differ by state. So we have to 
have the checklist of everything the individual state requires, and then go in and you know pull the files and have our examiners go through them. But we're looking, we'll be checking documentation, title transfers, loan mod uh, activity, all of that. And it's, again, it's going to take some time before we can complete it, uh, weeks, you know. But uh, but I think it's very important to do that. And I think um, you know one thing I'm particularly interested in is staffing and doing some horizontal review of the level of staffing at these servicers because some clearly do better than others. And I think maybe uh, that is also, there are a lot of issues uh, surrounding this, but I think uh, one of the things at the top of my list is they just don't have, they've never put enough resources into this to begin with. So, good, good question. Right. Good evening. Hi, Hi my name is Steve Acera. Um, I'm actually a graduate of the Eisenberg School, oh, great. <laughs> class of 1980. I wish you were teaching there when I was there. I would have loved to have taken your course. Um, I also completed the uh, dispute resolution program here at the law school that Professor Sander chairs. Um, and I've been in the securities industry for over 20 years, and I've served as a National Securities Arbitration Panel Chairman for the New England region for over the past 15 years. And we see a lot of investors come before us who've lost money uh, due to a variety of circumstances looking to recapture their losses. In times of financial crisis like we went through in 2008 and panic selling occurs, people end up in money market funds. Uh, <laughs> now, when the money mar first money market fund broke the buck uh, in 2008, um, some of us <laughs> in the industry envisioned possible Armageddon. Right. Um, and when interest rates start to rise inevitably and bond funds start to tank, uh, possibly as much as stock funds did in 2008, uh, people may again flee to the safety of money market funds. And I was wondering what role you see for the FDIC or the SIPC uh, to maintain the safety and stability and security of money market funds within brokerage accounts and at mutual fund firms. So um, I, I don't think there will be a role for us. I think it is important for people to understand if they invest in, in money market uh, mutual funds that those are those are not those do not have a, a federal guarantee. And I think the SEC requires some fairly rigorous disclosures on that so that people do understand those are not guaranteed. And certainly they're uh, um, they have very stringent liquidity requirements and all of that. But they're they, you know they, they they can break the buck as we saw so that people just need to understand people always need to understand their investments and the relative scale of risk and uh, and so I don't anticipate we would have a role in that uh, you know whether uh, the government did come in and backstop uh, those money market mutual funds for a period of time and so uh, of course that that rankles the banks because <laughs> they kind of came in and got it and they had to pay for it and then they left and the banks have always paid for it so that that's a bit of a you know bank versus money market uh, mutual fund uh, issue, but I don't, uh, I, I think it's just a matter, you know, it, we don't regulate it, we don't uh, and, and shouldn't, and I think uh, people just need to understand what they are and what the risks are involved, and they need to, need to differentiate. It's, it's, not an, it's not a government-backed uh, insured account, and it's just very important for people to understand that. You, you, do you see any um, role for credit quality uh, regulation on the holdings within those funds? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know. I think the, um, you know, the, this, this, you know, the difficult thing with this crisis was whatever, what, what people thought um, individually was safe and low risk collectively turned to be disastrous. And I think you can quickly say that with short-term lending. You're with, oh, we're just lending short, we can get out fast, right? So, yep, so everybody was short and everybody was relying excessively on, not everybody, but a lot of institutions were relying too much on short-term funding. And then when the system started to seize up, all that funding went away. And so even though people, you know, these investors uh, uh, individually thought they were playing it safe by being short systemically, it, it, was a, it was a disastrous situation. So I think maybe the focus maybe is, and there is a lot of focus now on FSOC and, and among individual regulators about liquidity and creating more incentives uh, for more stable, uh, for financial institutions for having more stable funding structures. 
Uh, and uh, so I think that is, that is going to be a, a key focus uh, of the duration of the funding, uh, as well as uh, any kind of credit risk they may be taking. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Hi, uh, I'm Joel Langardio. I'm a mid-career student at the Kennedy School. And my question is about public perception. Right. Um, if the people don't believe in you or your work or your institution, yeah. you're in trouble. Yeah. And uh, I remember at the height of the, height of the crisis, uh, an incredible piece on 60 Minutes that showed never before seen access uh, into the FDIC. And it was uh, an amazing PR piece to show the world is not ending, we're, right. you know, we're surviving. Right. Right. Uh, but beyond that, I'm wondering what thought have you given to telling your story of what do you want, what you want to do from here on out, your change and your, uh, right. you know, just the story of that, how to compel people to get buy into what you right. want to do? Right. Well, that's a good question. You know, I think um, I've been at the FDIC for about uh, four and a half years now. I, I, I came there in June of 2006 thinking it was going to be a very calm, nine to five kind of a job. And uh, <laughs> so my big issue was whether Walmart should have a bank uh, when, I, when I took uh, uh, the chairmanship. And, but one thing I did do immediately, and the banks were mad at me when I did it, was we went out and started raising premiums. <laughs> so we built up that fund It was because I think it was too low. And they were saying, oh, the system is safe. You don't need more money. And I said, yes, we do. So, But um, I had a breakfast with Bill Seidman uh, very early on in my tenure, and he said, the FDIC is all about public confidence, and the key to the success in this job is being open and accessible to the media. And so we have very, uh, we take that to heart culturally. We are open, we are transparent. I mean, there are obviously there are certain parts about the bank closing process that have to be kept confidential, but once the bank is closed, we're very transparent about who bought it, what they paid for it, um, and, uh, and I think those are all good things that have uh, given us uh, credibility with the media. So. I think that's just an ongoing uh, cultural uh, perspective that will always be at the FDIC. And we're doing that now with Dodd-Frank implementation. We set up a special website as if the other regulators have, have done the same thing. Anybody comes in to talk to us, that's fine. We welcome them, but we're going to put their name and you know their topic uh, up on the website. And we're going to have, we have an open door policy, so if you want to request a meeting, we will, we will try to accommodate that, whoever you are. Uh, we're doing roundtable discussions. We're webcasting those. Um, on this resolution authority, we want our rules to be crystal clear, uh, and so nobody feels like if an institution does fail, uh, nobody's surprised that they're going to take a loss. And so uh, I think I think you know, what you're talking about is very important. It's just kind of a day-to-day -day objective of ours uh, to make sure uh, that we are transparent in what we do. And you know, I think there's, uh, I think it helps. But there's so much cynicism about government right now, and I think a lot of it's just explaining to people what you do. It's, it's easier for the FDIC. We provide a very tangible benefit. We protect your bank deposits, and people really they understand that, they appreciate that, they relate to it. Not only do we protect them, but if the bank fails, we provide virtually seamless access to the banks. So you don't have to worry about your checks bouncing or, or anything else. Uh, and we work very hard and and have a lot of infrastructure to make sure that access is, is continuous. So, um, but I think also one of the reasons why we do, uh, people do think well of the FDIC, and that's not me, they've always thought well of the FDIC, is because we have a very tangible mission, it's one that people can relate to and understand and appreciate, and, and we stay focused on that. And so I think more broadly for the government, I think that's a, that's a good lesson, uh, because there's just a lot of cynicism about government right now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this question is basically a follow-up to that one. Mm -hmm. As an older person, I have money in the bank, mm -hmm. and I keep it under 100000 mm -hmm. And if I get more, I put it in another bank. Okay. Very simple question. How big is the purse you have if, if all the banks in the country were to fail? How many would it take for, for, to, to collapse the system? And really, how safe is the American banking system for the small investor? Well, it doesn't. I will say <laughs> we have about... Um, there are uh, about 7,800 uh, banks in the United States. Right. We have about, uh, was it rich, 829, I think, on the troubled bank list. And uh, those are, so it's a little above 10%, but most of those do not fail. I think their historical average is about 13% of the banks that go on the troubled trouble bank list actually fail. So uh, people, first of all, most of the banks are healthy. They're making money, and so people should understand that. The second thing is if a bank fails, it's not like if, so if we have, you know, $100 million of insured deposits in the bank, we take $100 million in losses. That's not how it works because under our process, we can be receiver for the whole bank. We sell the assets to recoup our, uh, you know, backstopping the, the deposits. And so the losses will be, um, for large institutions, they can be very small. For the smaller institutions, they can be as high as 20 25%. So uh, we have a, a fund uh, that is, uh, we have about $45 billion in cash right now. The negative, the net worth of the fund is negative 
because of our accounting methodology and we reserve in advance sure. for, for projected losses, but our cash position is very strong. Um, bank failures are peaking this year. Actually, our losses this year will be lower than they were last year. And we have substantial authority to borrow from Treasury if it, if it ever came to that. We have a $100 billion credit line we can access immediately. Then we can also uh, borrow working capital, posting the assets of failed banks as collateral for additional borrowings above that. So people really do not need to worry. This is a system that's been around for 76 years. <laughs> it's worked very well. And believe me, I, I, I keep a very close eye on our financial resources. And uh, it's, it's really, people should not worry. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chairman Mayor, I'm Leonard Ellman. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much for that lucid review of Dodd-Frank, which I had really not understood previously. Good. My question is, uh, I heard the uh, noted economist Simon Johnson on television earlier this week uh, argue that the financial system is far more centralized now in the hands of the huge banks than it was before the crisis began. And he argued strongly that this trend is inevitably going to increase. All right. I was wondering if you would agree with him, right. and if you do, don't you believe that this is a, a serious problem for the, for the nation's financial health? Yeah. Well, I think concentration is a, a serious issue, uh, and I think, uh, I am hoping, and uh, it is my expectation that the measures we are putting in place now will create pressures to downsize, not to grow. Uh, raising capital, uh, you know, if you've got, to, you've got to have more capital, it makes it more difficult for you to grow. It makes it, 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 makes it more expensive for you to grow. Um, too big to fail, ending too big to fail, sending a strong message to uh, those who invest in these institutions that they're, they're at risk of loss. They will put more demands on management to be more transparent about what they're doing, what kind of risks they're taking, are they on top of it? And I think that's, that's, that's more difficult to make that case to the very large complex institutions. Uh, also, Dodd-Frank clearly uh, skews the playing field towards the smaller institutions. Uh, community banks of less than $10 billion are pretty much protected from all the major provisions uh, of Dodd-Frank. And so I think the, there, there was a pur purposeful attempt in Dodd-Frank to put more burdens on the large institutions to force them to internalize the risks that were externalized during this crisis while giving some greater relief to the community banks. So I, I'm hoping, it's my expectation that over time, this will this will make adjustments and will give the, the smaller institutions a more uh, competitive playing field. Yeah, you know, I would, I would also say, though, I think, you know, I try not to paint everybody with the same brush. So I don't, I don't think all large institutions are bad, just not all community banks. Some of them made some big mistakes, too. So I think it is important from a consumer perspective for people to judge for themselves the relationship they have with their financial institution. If they're happy about it, fine. If they're not, go down the street, you know. And I think one of, I, one of the reasons why I think it's very important to maintain a robust community banking sector is I think that's important for customer choice because there are some advantages that a smaller institution can provide uh, that some may like, just as there are institutions, uh, advantages that a large national institution can provide. But uh, I think all of these measures, again, will put more burdens on the bigger banks and, uh, and help the smaller institutions compete. Thank yeah, you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, good evening. My name is Alexander Rossolimo. I'm chairman of a think tank of the Center for Security and Social Progress. Uh, some 30 years ago, when I was working for the Boston Consulting Group, I did a study on the banking industry. At that time, there were about 11,000 banks in the U.S. But I was surprised to learn that in some countries, major countries like I think Japan and Canada, the number of banks is very small. You can almost count them on yes. the fingers of both hands. That's right. And since then, there's been some consolidation that the number of U.S. banks has gone down. So my question is, is the increased consolidation of the U.S. banking industry good for the banking industry, good for the consumer, and good for the economy in general? Yeah. Well, I think that's a good question. You know, I, I, my, uh, I have some really smart researchers and economists on my staff, and we can't find any academic research that shows significant economies of scale <laughs> with these very large financial institutions, you know, these promised efficiencies and, and lower, you know, cost of uh, products, it just can't find it, right? So uh, by the same token, though, I would, I would like this to be controlled more by market mechanisms. It's, it's hard for the government to just come in and say, we don't like you, you're big, you, you need to break yourself up. I mean, without, with resolution authority, they get into trouble, we can do that, right? But, you know, I, I think it's, this is something that I think through the levers of more regulation, higher capital, ending too big to fail, over time we can downsize some of these very large institutions and, and create a better playing field. But you're right, I know from an economic standpoint, 
I, I just don't think the research is there that shows that you, you get a lot of it. Uh, you, you get the benefits that uh, supposedly were, were, were going to be achieved. So, thank you. Hello, my name is Fulmar Moras. I'm a second year student at the business school. And part of what we learned this year and last year was that a lot of people didn't make the tough decisions or take the tough stands they had to take leading up to the crisis that could have potentially averted it. What advice would you have for individuals that are beginning to pursue careers where they may have influence to make or impact those tough decisions in the future? Well, <clears throat> boy, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, you get into a situation like that, you have to make a decision. You have to take some risk. And so I think you just need to have your eyes open on that. And, and frequently you'll be uh, operating with imperfect information. I know we were during the crisis, but uh, you have to have uh, get the best information you can and evaluate the pros and cons and then move because uh, in a crisis situation, inaction is not an option. And, uh, and so I, I think uh, my best advice is do your research, get as much information as you can, uh, weigh it, and have smart people around you, you can bounce ideas off, but then at some point you just gotta you know, take, a, take a deep gulp and, and, and move ahead. I, I do think too, you know, I, I, it concerns me sometimes, we had to make a lot of decisions, and a lot of these decisions were just, they were just made in the fog of war. They were, we, we were, it was a crisis, so we were looking at the edge of the abyss, uh, we didn't have the information we needed, and, uh, and it distresses me, you know, two years later, <laughs> all the second guessing starts, you know, and, and, you know, was it pretty? No. Was it perfect? No. Did I like it? No. Uh, but what we, the tools we had at the time, uh, we, did, we used what we had to, and, and the system was stabilized. We did avoid a Great Depression, which I think was, was a very uh, distinct possibility if, if the stabilization measures weren't uh, undertaken. So, and I think uh, in terms of uh, fostering uh, young people uh, to take leadership positions and, make, and be willing to go into government service and make tough, tough decisions, that, Politicians and the public generally need to understand that and respect that, that they want high quality people in government. And I think a lot of people here, because if you're affiliated with the Kennedy School, you probably have an interest in public service. You know, you need to respect their ability and their expertise to make decisions in difficult situations and don't go back, you know, a year or two later and, and start savaging them. I, I think that's really, really counterproductive. So, um, but needless to say, notwithstanding all the, you know, the bruises I have and some of the rest of us, uh, you know, I think public service is, is something that I hope uh, people here uh, will consider. And uh, it, it's a very good feeling uh, to, uh, to do something that's tangible and meaningful for the public. And notwithstanding uh, some of the, uh, the criticisms we've taken, we all have had, you know, the letters and emails I get from people thanking me, thanking them for protecting their money, uh, or showing leadership, it's just, it's worth everything. So I, I hope you go into government, I hope you'll be a good decision maker. Uh, hi, my name is Philip and I'm a junior at the college. Uh, my question actually dovetails with what you were just mentioning. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are graduating uh, this year and they're going to uh, many different jobs on Wall Street. None of them are going to the FDIC. None of them are going to the Federal Reserve. None Brian. of them are going to the SEC. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how you as a financial regulator right. think about um, competing in a labor market where uh, the public-private pay differential is huge. Right. Well, it is. And we, we actually can pay better for those of you. <laughs> we pay better. Uh, then other, we do have the authority, the bank regulators do have the authority to pay somewhat better than, than the, the standard government salary for just that reason, because we do compete with the private sector. But you know, I think there's, I've been in government a long time, most of my career, and uh, I, th I think there is a, um, you know, we welcome people that want to come and have some limited uh, experience with the public sector and then move on someplace else, but there are also people that just want to make a career out of public service, and I think they do have a different attitude towards what their objectives are in life. And so the money is, you know, everybody wants financial security and all that, but making these eye popping salaries really isn't as important to them. And, and you know, maybe those are the kind of people we want working at the FDIC. I'm, I'm not sure I want somebody working, you know, who wants, wants their big bonus even if the bank lost money last year. I'm, I'm not sure I want those people at the FDIC anyway. So, um, you know, it's not to disparage making money. It's all well and good if, you know, if you've earned it. But, uh, but uh, I think there is a, a those who just have a special attitude toward public service, maybe that the compensation uh, isn't as much. And so we, we can, based on the content of the work that we do, I think we can, that's an added uh, way that we can compete with the private sector. So, okay. One last question. Sure, okay. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Beal, and I'm a 2006 graduate of the Harvard College, and I'm currently a first year student in the business school. 
Uh, my question is, reflecting upon the experience of Washington Mutual and the FDIC's intervention uh, transferring ownership from TPG Capital over to JP Morgan, what is your view going forward, first in private equity firms and hedge funds owning other uh, banks, and then two, uh, their participation, or hedge funds and private equity firms, participation in the liquidation process right. uh, of banks going forward. Right. Well, uh, the Wall Mufayan resolution didn't have anything to do with, with who owned it. It, it, was, it, it made a lot of high-risk mortgages on the West Coast, and it failed as did virtually every other uh, mortgage lender that made high-risk mortgages on the West Coast. So I guess I, I would separate those two issues. I think on the question of hedge funds generally, uh, you know, we uh, they we facilitate uh, their ability to charter uh, uh, institutions and compete in our, our failed bank process. We do, since they don't have a regulatory track record, we do have some higher requirements. We require 10% capital, for instance, uh, for them, and we require that they they commit to run the bank for three years. We we don't want people just coming in and flipping uh, flipping the uh, flipping the uh, the charter. And so uh, we do have some uh, added restrictions, uh, but they have uh, they have come in and they bid a lot. Uh, they've won several bids, and so uh, again, I think people need to understand there is a you know if with deposit insurance uh, it is you, you need to be regulated because deposit insurance is really valuable, and uh, and uh, there's a lot of government exposure uh, for these institutions. So you need to have bank owners who understand regulation, the need for safety and soundness regulation with deposit insurance. But, you know, we, uh, if you accept regulation and uh, we have some additional prudential standards for what we call, and it's not just hedge funds, any non-traditional investors, those that do not have a track record in the past, we can look to managing a bank. Uh, we have these uh, additional requirements, but I actually think they've worked out pretty well. So, okay, thanks. With that, let me bring the evening to a close. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.